Okay, so before we start, I do want to say at the end, um, over there we'll be selling um, Hidden History Maynard books and only in Maynard mugs. Uh, all the funds raised from there go to Trail of Flowers. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but in 2018, to beautify the Asimovia Rail Trail, I started an organization called Trail of Flowers with the intent of planting thousands upon thousands of flowers along the Asimovia Rail Trail. So we now have to date spent planted more than 7,000 daffodils, wow. hundreds and hundreds of other plants in Acton, Maynard, and Marlboro. We're adding Hudson this year. Um, have raised and spent $10,000 for that issue. Um, if you get up towards the Asimovia Rail Trail, um, across from Christmas Motors. The daffodils are really starting to come in and the next couple of weeks so they'll, they'll sort of max out and it'll just be a beautiful row of yellow up there. Uh, there's more planted along behind Cumberland Farms Gas Station, High Street, up towards the Acton End at the trailhead and by the Sylvia Street access. So all those flowers we planted plus whatever grows naturally uh, is just a way of making the Asimov Rail Trail Less boring, <laughs> more interesting, more exciting. And we're trying to plant things that start from the earliest part of the bloom all the way to the last blooming before the frosts. So think flowers. Uh, we'll be planting again this spring and this fall. Uh, the um, Maynard Community Gardeners donates these unsold plants from their plant sale in May, and those end up along the rail trail. So it, it's just really been a community effort. So I do say... Consider buying the book, The Mugs, and, and whether you do or don't, do get out on the rail trail, especially in the next couple of weeks and months as the forsythia are blooming and the daffodils are blooming and the daylilies are going to be blooming. Um, and even though I hate to say this, the um, Japanese knotweed, <laughs> there's a patch of that along, and that's late blooming. It turns out honeybees love it. I'm not saying plant Japanese knotweed anywhere, but... Uh, it is a pollinator-friendly plant, after all. Daffodils are not. Forsythia is not. I didn't, never knew that. But forsythia doesn't produce pollen, doesn't produce nectar. It is eye candy for us, but useless for pollinators. So one has to understand what one's planting. Flowers alone are not enough. Uh, all those double flowers, like the double flower Rose of Sharon's are too complicated for being it into um, some of the more complicated um, daylily hybrids. Again, too complicated for bees to get into. So one really has to understand what Pondale friendly means. It can't just be, you know, pretty colors. <laughs> yeah, uh, looks like you're getting a few more seats. And There's a few up here. Okay. It's one. You want to go for it? Yeah, I think we'll just go ahead and uh, I'll give you a quick intro. Okay. So, uh, hello everybody and thanks for coming out today. Uh, uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, David a little bit. He, of course, is a local historian who has written several books about Maynard and was instrumental behind the uh, latest sesquicentennial history book uh, published for the town's uh, 150th anniversary in 2021. He's also written a few other books which, as he mentioned, are for sale over there. You can pick those up with some, uh, some only in Maynard mugs as well. Uh, between 2009 and 2022, David wrote a weekly column in the Beacon Villager newspaper, uh, rest in peace, uh, newspaper, uh, with topics that included uh, local history, outdoor recreational activity, opportunity, uh, re recreational uh, opportunities, observations on nature, health topics, and more. The, um, he, he does still blog on his, uh, on his website at maynardlifeoutdoors.com. Yes. And uh, I just wanted to uh, briefly thank the Maynard Historical Commission, uh, who we're, we're going to be partnering with uh, in the coming months to bring some more local history programs to the library, and uh, also our friends at uh, WAVM for recording this program, uh, which you'll be able to see on YouTube uh, probably later on in the week. And I just want to give one last plug. Uh, we are going to be doing a um, History of Massachusetts Libraries on uh, this coming Tuesday, the, the 9th, at 7 o'clock. And historian Alan Earl, will, we're just going to talk about the, uh, the amazing history of um, some of the more unique libraries that uh, are in Massachusetts and their architecture. So um, you can sign up for that uh, right on our website. And uh, so thank you, everybody. I'm going to turn it over to David. Thank you, Jeremy. So as you see there, this is how Maynard became Maynard. Um, and... <sighs> 
You've all seen this sign at various places as one's entering Main Street. I'm going to do a little bit of a, uh, a leap to a different topic. If you've ever looked closely at that seal that's, that's in the center of that sign, that is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts state seal. It's on the state flag. Um, it has a uh, uh, Native American standing on it. And uh, there's a lot of controversy uh, about this, and there is a state effort to replace it. Uh, marching very slowly uh, forward. So I do want to point out that the initial seal for when this was a colony had a picture of um, basically a uh, almost uh, naked uh, Native American man with some leaves covering his, his, the center of his torso. And coming out of his mouth was a little word balloon that said, come over and help us. That didn't work out well, did it? <laughs> So starting around 1780 or present, there's always been some Native American on one form or other. Um, this present one shows a, a sword held by arm over the figure, uh, which is mostly is how you know, it talks about Commonwealth Massachusetts, you know, wanting freedom with peace. Obviously, if not peace, then by the sword. But the Native Americans sort of think this, take this much more personally, like <sighs> things not going well with the Europeans who got here. Part of the image of the Native Americans um, represent various Native Americans who were actually killed in wars against the colonists. Uh, the belt, for example, was a belt worn by Medawar, also known as King Philip. In King Philip's war, um, at the end of that, he was killed. And his, his, his skull was displayed in Plymouth for many years thereafter. Um, so there's a discussion starting in 2021 to replace this. The status right now is the state has agreed to and is trying to establish a committee or commission to come up with a design contest asking professional artists to propose a, a new image. Um, interestingly, the Native Americans were sounded out as would like a Native American image to stay on the state seal, just not this one, while most other people would like to see no figure at all and some other symbol, state flower, state whale. Uh, we have a state whale, the right whale. Uh, or, or something else. So the point is, look at this next time you're driving to Maynard and realize that at some distant, not so distant future time, that would be replaced. Therefore, I want to start with a land acknowledgement because when we talk about the history of Maynard. I'm not going to start in 1871, the town became a town. I'm not going to start in 1635 when Sudbury, which land later became part of Maynard. I'm going to start a thousand years ago and say the Native Americans who were here were the Nipmuc. And they were a sort of non-ocean area of the, uh, I think we have. Well, this, we'll, we'll get back to this for a moment. If you look at when these various towns were formed, you can see that the early ones were the farming communities, Concord, Sudbury, Marlborough, um, Stowe after King Philip's War, which is 18, um, 1680, 76. Um, Acton also was spun off from Concord, um, both in Lincoln. And then you have Hudson and Marlboro, which obviously are very different. Those came to be because they were mill towns. And the distinction there being um, they were on rivers. Because on rivers, there was water power. And because there was water power, there were factories of the industrial age, and you had a higher population density, and they felt that they were not being well served by their parent towns for Hudson, Marlboro, for Maynard, Sudbury, and Stowe. And so they asked the state if they could secede and become their own towns. And they did, therefore, in the mid-1800s. If we look at what things looked like before the colonists get here, you notice most of the tribal groups and all of these groups are speaking variants of the Algonquin languages from Delaware well up into Canada. Uh, but these are sort of separate and quite stable areas established some 2,000, 1,000 years ago from these various tribes. So the whole, let's call it central Massachusetts down into northern Connecticut was Nipmuc. Um, without access to ocean, population, population density was low. The Nipmuc population before the Europeans got here was estimated at only 10,000 people for that entire area. The tribes that had access to the coast had access to shellfish, more fishing, had larger population densities, larger villages, 
And, and so you have to understand that the whole central part of Massachusetts was, by our standards, not populated very densely. Once the Europeans got here, they brought European diseases. So the point there is, really from 1616 onward, um, over 90% of the Native Americans died from various diseases that were brought by the Europeans. And this was before any of the more significant wars that were developed. And the Native Americans referred to as the Great Dying. The entire eastern Algonquin population, again from Delaware up into Canada, was estimated to about 100,000 to 150,000. That's all those tribes in all that area. I think I may have skipped one. I do want to say the diseases, people tend to have heard of smallpox, but there were actually several diseases. There's leptospirosis, which is bacterial, scarlet fever, smallpox, measles, influenza. Each of these were plagues that strongly affected uh, the Native Americans. In some cases, villages were found abandoned, bodies unburied, because people had died so quickly and other people were just leaving. Uh, so when the English came, it was referred to as the Great Migration. And the main reason was that the Puritans were opposed to the Church of England. King Charles uh, opposed the Puritans and their role in Parliament as they were a persecuted religious minority who left mostly going to Europe, um, but some also coming into England. The, these emigrants were relatively well off. Um, they came off with money, with skills, with farm equipment, um, with servants, with indentured servants, um, educated, and their settlements always started coastal and then gradually moved inland. Again, Coastal settlements were easy. You had access by boat. You had better access to ocean foods. But you started moving in for farmland. So the population for all English colonies, and we have a few numbers here, um, went from 5,000, 50,000 by 1650, over a million people by 1750. So a tremendous continuing growth of this population. Um, let's see what happened. Ah. I want to make a distinction here between English immigration and land and French, because the English saw this as settler colonization. They were coming in to farm. They were bringing their animals with them. They needed uh, land for farming because with domesticated animals, you needed more food per acre than if you're just living off the land and the wild animals. So once you're bringing in horses and cattle and sheep and goats and pigs and chickens, you needed high density land ownership versus low density, what the Native Americans were used to using the land for, even though they were farming corn and beans and squash and seasonally moving to gather geese and deer and, and, and freshwater mussels. Resources colonization, in, in contrast, the French were colonizing Canada and the areas further north, but they were there for the resources, primarily pelts from animals like beaver so they had military outposts and trading posts, but they were low density. And that was one of the strong distinctions between the two that, of course, led to then later the success of the English against the French in the wars and the loss of the French land. If we talk about land taking, King James of England claimed by right of discovery all of North America. Spain and Portugal made similar claims to much of the rest of the world, starting with South America, but other areas of the world. Concord was a true purchase, um, although a little bit disputed because the trade that was made from the English to the Native Americans was with the Pawtucket, who weren't actually the residents. It was the Nipmuc who were the residents of the area, but the Pawtucket came in and said, we're going to sell you this land. But it was, let's call it a, a, a true purchase. The system was that the colony would grant a deed of area to people who then were supposed to purchase it from the Native Americans. Um, some of this was true purchase. Um, Sudbury started off as, again, a true purchase. Um, however, some of it was also seized. So there were, there were some areas where it was seized and then later, sometimes decades later, um, so you can see what happened with Sudbury. 
initially was called the Two Mile Grant that brought it up to the Sudbury, to the Assabet River, which was then officially purchased 1684 after King Philip's War. Similarly, you'll also see um, Stowe uh, claimed 1683, purchased 1684. Again, these purchases I'm putting in quotes because they're just finding a remaining Native American to sign off on what has already been accomplished on the ground by war. Um, in 1871, again, Maynard took acres from Stowe and, and Sudbury, and we'll talk about what that came out. So the wars were Metacom's War, also Metacom, Metacomet, also known as King Philip. Um, the important line here I want you to say is he's quoted as saying, I am determined not to live until I have no country. He saw the Native Americans being displaced from this area. Um, so there are various numbers of wars there, uh, but the end result, of course, the Native Americans were defeated. A, a minor point here is that in 1641, the colony decided that there would be no slavery except for prisoners taken in just wars. So after these, these wars, Native Americans were taken prisoner, were then shipped down and sold into slavery in the Caribbean, and African Americans who were already there were brought back up into the colonies. So the colony of Massachusetts was the first colony, the first future state, to legalize slavery in 1640. And it was legal here until 1780, when it was the first state of the new country to abolish slavery. But for 140 years, slavery was legal here in Massachusetts. So if we talk about what became Stowe, Pompositicate Plantation was initially surveyed in 1660, not actually settled as Stowe until 1683. So you'll see that Stein going to Stowe, and they'll claim it. But if you leap forward 160 years, Stowe and Sudbury are both agrarian towns with small, seasonally operated mills. Always in these towns, the very first mill was a mill that would either cut timber for planks, for boards, and also grind grain, corn, wheat for flour. So these are dual purpose mills that would function in the spring and the fall, spring for cutting timber, fall for grinding grain. Um, and, and these later became reimagined or revisited or re revamped to becoming industrial mills. But mills started out always as the first mill you needed was you needed a grist mill and a timber mill. So, in 1846, Amory Maynard and William Knight show up in this area with a lot of experience and a lot of money. What had happened is they had both had mill operations in Marlborough and Framingham, respectively, and were bought out by the city of Boston for their water rights because Boston wanted to pipe the water from Marlboro and from Framingham to the city of Boston for drinking water. So these two men in their, their middle age, experienced construction, experienced running wool mills, are, are bought out, have lots of folding money. Rather than just retiring rich, because that's what they were at the time, they decided to partner and, and look for a new venture. And their new venture was this area. What their vision was is there was a small mill on Mill Street. And they thought that if you went further upstream and built a larger dam, dug a canal further downstream, and built a mill, you'd have a larger vertical drop. Because vertical drop is what provides power. The more vertical drop, the bigger your water wheel can be, the more power you can get. So they built a mill, they built a dam, they built a canal connecting the two, and started operations in 1846. And they were profitable from the very first year onward. With the mill, you need, now needed roads and you needed a population because you had to bring in the raw goods, the wool, which is coming from first Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, Canada, further, further for stream. The railroad came in in 1850. Uh, important point here that was critical is that with the Civil War, most of the mills in New England were cotton mills. And with the Civil War, there was no shipment of cotton from those mills from the cotton fields in the south to the mills in the north, 
Meanwhile, the wool mills were able to keep operating and the cotton mills were unable to convert to wool. It was a very different process entirely. So the people who had wool mills, these people suddenly had contracts with the, the Union Army to make blankets, to make uniforms out of wool and, and tremendously prospered. So we look at the two, we see that the Maynard family got here early. They were part of the Great Migration. Amory, therefore, was seventh generation. Uh, when his father died in 1820, he was only 16, but he took over the family mill in Marlboro. Uh, that was, again, was a grist and timber mill. But he also started a construction company. Um, he sold Fort Meadow Pond to Boston for water, moved to Aspet Village, started up buying line at the he was age 42, and had a wife and three sons. He constructed and managed the mill. He also had a construction company called A&L Maynard that constructed many of the houses, including most of the houses on, on my street, on Maple Street. So the first owner of my house was the A&L Construction Company, sold it to a Charles Brooks. Uh, again, the Brooks family owned a lot of the land. So you see, the, and it was Amory and Lorenzo, his oldest son, who was the, um, uh, the business team here. His middle son, William, um, never quite did as much for the business or did as much for any business. And then his youngest son um, died young. William came from England. He was a mill superintendent, mill owner in Framingham. Uh, by 1843, he definitely was very successful. He had over 200 employees. Uh, he sold Lake Cotituate to Boston for water supply, partnered with Amory, but he didn't actually live here. He had that move to Boston, and he was the Boston end of the operation selling the finished wool goods. They started off doing carpet, and then he moved into cloth for, again, for, for blankets and for, so they weren't manufacturing clothing here, they're manufacturing the cloth for clothing. Um, so he was the Boston manager of sales to 1842, uh, just about when his wife died and he retired, and he died 1870, no heirs, and actually I can't even track down where he's buried. So he sort of vanishes from history. Um, there was a saying, I'm gonna say not true, that when Amory and William met Amory had the experience and, and William had the money. And by the time we were done, Amory had the money and William had had an experience. <laughs> I don't think it's true, but it does sort of say Amory as a, as a man was a man who, who um, saw money and took money. And as people also said that he, he took money with a long arm and he gave out money with a short arm. So he was definitely the sort of person who kept and retained his wealth. The growth of the woman was progressive. It started out with a few wooden frame buildings, and they were selling wool yarn and carpets. Uh, Main Street was open, and it had a bridge over the Asphalt River. The railroad reaches Maynard, the mill expands, more buildings. Um, Amory is a deacon of the church and has the congregational church built. Um, the mill expands, um, the mill expands more during the Civil War. Uh, more expansion brick, and one of the important points is now switched over to to steam, because with the railroad, you're bringing in coal. And the amount of water power you could actually get out of the Ass River was really quite limited. It's not a big river. It's not like what's going on in Lowell and Lawrence. So it's hard to imagine this, but all of this operation started because they could get 50 horsepower out of water power, and that's it. That's all the power they got, but that was enough because once you built the mill, it was free. And what you did was you dammed up the river, as a matter of fact, you, when you shut down operations each weekend, Saturday noon, it was a half day of work. At that point, you shut off the river and you backed up as much water as you could till Monday morning. So the river, which by the way has like, I think the point had nine dams, was an on again, off again river because every Saturday noon, each dam shut off the river and backed up water so that Monday morning at 7 a.m. they could turn it on again and start power again. So even Thoreau commented on the fact that this was basically an on-again, off-again river and had no natural feel to it anymore. Uh, Amory also paid uh, for the building of uh, St. Bridget's Church because most of his, many of his workers, early workers, were Irish Catholic. Um, and also we see now the cemetery uh, is constructed about the same time. Now, when the idea of creating a town came about, 
there were some very grandiose ideas of what it was going to be. And there was a petition that was written, signed, but never submitted. This is the actual original petition now in the possession of the Maynard Historical Society. And it was to create, let's call it, a greater Maynard that would encompass a chunk of Acton and Concord, more of Stowe, and almost the entire northern third of Sudbury. The reason being there was a gunpowder mill on the Acton, what was going to become the Acton Maynard border. And those people wanted into this town. And they wanted more of the land in Stowe. And, and definitely the northern, the poorly populated northern end of Sudbury thought they might do better being part of this new town. So there was this, again, petition, circa 1870, signed, but they thought they may have more success with the official Fowler petition. So this one, again, um, no longer looked to get part of Acton and Concord, but definitely was still looking to be a larger town. So the, the official petition still proposed this larger area. There was pushback. As you can see here, um, both Stowe and Sudbury, well, first they're proposing, why? Because they're too far. It's too far to walk to church. It's too far to go to school. Sudbury and Stowe are not taking care of us. Our population keeps on increasing, but we're not getting the services we need. We therefore, your petitioners pray, that the above territory be incorporated into town bearing the name Maynard. Important point there is I've seen the original document um, down in, in the state archives. There was a blank for the name, and it's written in, in a different hand. <laughs> so cl clearly there was a, what's the, what are we going to name it? What are we going to name it? It's going to be Maynard. <laughs> and that's what it became. This is sort of the map of what they wanted for northern Sudbury. So you notice there's Maynard, but there's a very large chunk of, of, of northern Sudbury that, that there, but there was a pushback. Uh, both in Sudbury and Stowe, there were counter proposals where they said, no, 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 no. You can't take that much of our town. You're taking the good part. You're taking the growing part. Um, so they paid off. Uh, Stowe and Sudbury were both paid off to basically let this secede and become its own town. So that, that line that you see in the bottom right called the two-mile line, that was where the original Sudbury ended, and then it was extended later to the um, Asawit River, and that's sort of where they were trying to re-grab again, uh, but it, it never came to pass. Stowe residents countered, and you can see, such a division would remove the only portion that has increased in its population and value, and as such a sundering, nice word, uh, would leave our ancient town in a weak and crippled condition, to which we must decidedly object. Sudbury um, voted against it. Um, some of the people voting for were the people who were going to be in the new town, so they definitely wanted. But then Stowe was paid um, close to 8,000 over seven years. Sudbury was paid uh, 20, 000, over 20,000 um, plus uh, more over years. The reason Sudbury got more is the mill was actually in what was Sudbury. And the railroad station was what was in Sudbury. So Sudbury got paid more because it included paying for the railroad that Sudbury owned. But the, in the end, what happened was um, it got 1,300 acres from Stowe, and it got 1,900 acres from Sudbury. And the population of Maynard at this point was larger than the parent towns that it separated from. If we note the first town's annual report that they had a celebration, included fireworks, renting cabin, cannon from Concord, transportation of the cannon, gunpowder for the cannon, uh, uh, entertaining bands, uh, an extra train on the railroad to bring in people. Uh, there were surveying proposed to lay out the town lines uh, and cornerstones. How many of you have seen any of the five cornerstones that Mark Maynard, a few. How many have seen all five? <laughs> Which involves some trespassing. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have pictures. So uh, there are cornerstones marking off the corners. Um, this one is right on Route 27 as you're crossing into Sudbury going south. It's off to the right. It shows the Maynard site, and the town is supposed to 
paint a number on it every 10 years to confirm it's still there. So you can notice Maynard hasn't really been up to date <laughs> in marking this sign. There's a stone, interestingly, that marks an intersection of Concord, Sudbury, Acton, and Maynard. It's a four-town corner, um, just as you're heading on 62 East, and then you have to head um, up on, on, I think, Concord Road. And there's a stone where each of the town, you know, is sort of sometimes marking, sometimes not marking, uh, that has been there, the stone is still there. Off of Rockland Avenue, deep in the, the marshy woods, there's a stone marking Maynard and Acton and, and Stowe. And then you can see people who had visited it back in 1966. Um, that's still there. If you're on Summer Street, which becomes Pompasidicate Street, heading towards Acton, no, towards Stowe, there's an apple orchard on the right. Up the hill in the apple orchard is this stone, marking the border between Stowe and, and, and Maynard. You're not supposed to go there. But I was back when there wasn't a fence. And <laughs> deep in the National Wildlife Refuge, there's the base that's all that's left because when the Army seized that in 1942 and brought in railroads to move the munitions in and out, they just, they just knocked it off its base. So all you have left is that little marker stone on the ground that shows the intersection of Sudbury, Stowe, and Maynard. Actually, the top of the original stone is here in Maynard, in the Maynard Historical Society collection. It's about like that. It, it's, it, I don't know who got it here, because it's not light. But anyway, we still have the top of the original stone. And those are the five stones marking the, uh, the, the current boundaries. Now, Maynard becoming Maynard is not the end of how Maynard became Maynard. If you see this map, you can see how the density is sort of to the right. There's a lot of empty space here in the, uh, up and down. Um, you've got a much larger pond. I don't know if you realize that, but if you grew up here, which I did not, if you grew up here, you realize the pond has been a shrinking pond over time. So this pond in this map, which is 1875, doesn't show the parking lot where the farmer's market is. It doesn't show the parking lots on the other side that were brought in there for Digital Equipment Corporation, and it's now the site of where the, the fire station is. So the pond was larger. Um, there was no parking lot, actually, because there, there were no cars So uh, for the longest time. And the mill was smaller. So this is missing the three largest buildings, which were actually built out and over the pond. Uh, nicely, though, this map and this aerial view map both include my, my house on Naples Street. So it's nice for me to be able to see there. There's my house. And you can see a lot more. Again, a larger pond, a smaller mill, the unpopulated area up here. Let's just hope I never knock this over. <laughs> um, where all the streets are in the post-World War II housing came in. Uh, the, uh, the area for the uh, President's streets also came later. Um, if you'll notice, there, further down river, there was the paper mill. So the paper mill was where um, the 7-Eleven and um, I think Dunkin' Donuts now is, right at the corner of the Waltham Street Bridge. And that paper mill actually predated uh, the woolen mill, but it was a small operation with a small number of, of employees. But they were making paper for the newspapers in Boston. Population. And this chart took a, a lot of looking at, at census. But the point is, well after World War II, I'm going to say this again, well after World War II, the population of Maynard was larger than the population of Acton, Sudbury, and Stowe combined. Those were basically just farm towns still, apple orchards, chicken farms, low density population, and Maynard was the center. It was on the railroad. It was on the trolley. It had hotels. It had movie theaters. It had Woolworths. It had Sears. It had five hotels. Maynard was, was definitely the regional center of the area until well after uh, World War II when the better roads started making these towns commuter to suburb towns for Boston. Uh, also, once you had the 128 circle and the 495 circle, jobs moved further out of the city and the population of these towns took off and Maynard sort of flattened out at about 11,000, which is where it is now. Uh, 
Now, you look at what else was populating in this area. <laughs> the dark line is cows. So really, there was definitely a large number of dairy cows here, which gradually deteriorated. Horses sort of peaked just around 1900 at uh, 250 horses in Maine. We know this because there was an annual tax on horses and cows. So we don't count pigs. We don't count chickens. They were here, too. But we do know that horses and cows, and you see this if you go to the annual reports here in the library, that each year there's the number, of, there's a census basically of horses, and the horses gradually, gradually, and the cows gradually. So at the moment right now, there are no cows in Maynard. There are no horses in Maynard. Actually, I, I know the person who had the last horse. So at one point, this was a one-horse town. <laughs> um, and that was uh, Pete Gingrich. Who said, you know, when he was a teenager and his family stole the horses, he used to ride the horse over to, to Erickson's ice cream, tie up to the bar, <laughs> get some ice cream, ride back with his friends, you know. So there were definitely still horses around. Uh, now, not so much. No pigs. There's still a couple of people keeping goats, I think, in town. For a while, there were some alpacas or Latin, but I don't think there were any at the moment. So there we have the wildlife. There were pigs. There were chickens. This, this, there were mink. How many people know there was a mink farm here? Yeah. Yeah. Surprisingly, on what is now Concord Street Circle, a retirement community off of Concord Street, there was um, a mink farm that was there really up into the 1970s and was famous for being the first mink operation in the world to have white mink because of the advantages they took of, of a mutation that they started at Bread True. So there we have a mink farm in Maynard, for a very, and now no longer, but I, I've had spoken to people who said, what was it like? They said, it was horrifically smelly. <laughs> because mink are caged in individual open wire cages, basically about this high over the ground, rows and rows of them under a shed roof, and each day a glop of food is put on top, and the mink reaches up and pulls it down, and, and scraps and shit, pee, all go out the bottom. And uh, in addition to about six or seven or 8,000 mink, there were probably several million flies also <laughs> in the operation. Uh, anytime a cow or a horse took sick, the knacker would come drag it away over, bring it to the mink farm, and they'd run it through the grinder and add that to the, uh, the food. So it was, it was an operation we don't quite see here in Maynard anymore, but there was for a long time a, a mink farm. Failing upwards, and we'll touch on this slide again. So 1846 to 98, it was the Assabet Manufacturing Company making wool, and this was under the auspices of the Maynard family. It went bankrupt in 1898 because um, the federal government had ceased a tariff on foreign wool. And the import of foreign wool crushed the U.S. market and many mills, not just this one. So it wasn't mismanagement here, but it was a national decision. And then two years later, the tariff was reinstalled, but by that time, the mill had gone bankrupt and was taken over by the American Woolen Company, which was a multi-state conglomerate. And they, they were the ones who built the last largest buildings and uh, operated it for another 50 years. So again, Maynard almost did not stay Maynard. How many know this story? The bankruptcy meant people lost their jobs, and it turns out there was no bank in town and the mill, for its employees and business, served as a bank. So you as an employee could leave some of your income in an account held by the mill, and the mill would pay interest. And you were for business in Maynard, you could deposit money at the mill, which had a really nice safe. And they would hold your money and also pay interest. So people who either worked there or business in town, some of their money was being kept. And when the mill went bankrupt, they did not get a dollar on their dollar. They did not get 100 cents on their dollar because it seems Lorenzo Maynard, who was running at the time, took out his share first and left town. And there was a lot of animosity towards the Maynard family. That and also that Amory had always sort of promised he'd give some nice gifts to the town, some land, but he did not. So there was some animosity towards Amory. And there was a petition there filed in 1902 shortly after to change the name to Assabet. The American Woolen Company was also behind this. They just felt that they didn't, they didn't want the name associated with Maynard anymore because of the, the animosity of the bankruptcy. There were public hearings um, in the Capitol building and in Maynard. Citizens were quite divided 
a debate was heated. This is all in the newspapers. The state legislature killed the bill, so it didn't go forward. It wasn't put to a local vote, um, and Maynard remained Maynard. But there was a moment there where we might have, have become Acevedo. So we're back to this now, and the mill closed in 1950 because the Army contracts ended. So even though the Army was still buying blankets and wool, there weren't American Woolen Company was not selling it from this facility. They were selling from others, and they shuttered the mill. And then it was closed for a couple of years. And in 1853, a group of Worcester business informed Maynard Industries Incorporated and started renting out space and built to various companies. Oh, by the way, Lorenzo was so offended by the efforts of the town to change the name, and the town was so offended at him for basically absconding with some of what they felt was their money, that not only had he moved away, but he had his, his dead wife and his four dead daughters dug up out of the cemetery. <laughs> and moved to Mount Auburn Cemetery, where there is a very large, very pretty mausoleum. It says Lorenzo Maynard across the front. There's five stained glass windows. It's, 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 it's fancy. He had a bit of a, a, a monument complex. So he's got this nice big mausoleum there. He's also the one who built the clock tower. So Lorenzo um, had certain things in mind. But the point was, Lorenzo left. The town said good riddance. This town saved Maynard. And then we have Maynard. And they rented out all the space. This was entirely rented out. There were different companies. Uh, Raytheon was there. There were a lot of other companies there. The Beacon Village newspaper at the time called Beacon was there. And in 1957, a very small company called Digital Equipment Corporation rented about 9,000 square feet um, and started this little company making, um, well, computers. And um, they grew, and they grew, and they rented more space, and they grew, and they rented more space, and they grew, and they rented more space. Interesting, in that first building, because they were watching their pennies, too, um, the majority tenant in the building was Raytheon. And the building in the winter got no heat on weekends unless Raytheon called up on Friday noon and said, we want heat because we're going to have people working on the weekend. And at 1 o'clock, the... President Digital would call up and say, is there going to be heat? Because if it's going to be heat, he can have his people also working on the weekend, and he wouldn't have to pay for the heat. There wasn't air conditioning. Uh, they'd have the windows open. Pigeons would fly in. There were lots of problems. The point was, <laughs> Digital got bigger and bigger and bigger until it finally bought the entire complex in 1974 and owned it and ran it uh, until 1998. But over the 90s, there was a 41-year arc for digital. Digital equipment had grown from a couple of people to the second largest company in the world with over 100,000 employees worldwide, second only to IBM. And then due to a number of errors in decision and judgment and future seeing, crashed, sold off pieces, finally made itself small enough to sell it off Compact. Compact then sold itself to, to HP. And, and digital, except for digital, um, what's left? The bank? Um, but digital itself, and I think even the, 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 uh, the sports complex in Worcester, uh, but, but digital itself as a company is, is long gone. It seeded, it seeded the world with experienced people and computer companies, but digital itself just missed a number of major decisions and had that 41-year arc and went from basically nothing to nothing. And it's just a story to take in mind that that large doesn't necessarily mean forever. In 1998, um, Clock Tower Place got a tax break from the town and was able, therefore, to charge below market rents and fill it up again. So if you're here in, in 98, and when I moved here in 2000, it was full and operative. Uh, the, one of the major tenants was Monster. Uh, they were there from 98 to 2014. Also basically made some bad decisions, missed out on what became LinkedIn and Indeed and the other companies. And there's a remnant of Monster still out there, but it, it's it's smaller. Um, Clock Tower. Also, the tax break they got expired. They basically sold itself to Mill and Main, which are the current operators, um, sold it for a song. So Mill and Main, even though it's only about 50% rented and 40% occupied, 
is making a profit at that level. Uh, they'd like to fill it up, um, but they're not in any particular hurry. And that's the situation right now. Mill and Main owns it. It's operating it. So the statement, as goes the mill, so goes Maynard, was true perhaps for a very long time. And again, you have to realize people walked to work, walked out for lunch, walked back to work. Mm -hmm. um, there was a point there where the men went on strike because they wanted um, a 60-hour work week like the women had rather than the 70-hour work week that they had. So you have to remember what that situation was at the time. But right now, most of the people living in Maynard work elsewhere, commute elsewhere, we're living here, we've become a more of a classic suburban town than it was when this was in Milltown. But the buildings are still there, the density is there, the sidewalks are there, the rest, we're still a restaurant center uh, compared to the towns around us. Personally, I have to say nothing is what I consider a destination restaurant, but still restaurants are worth going to and, and having a meal at. Uh, it would be nicer if it was better, but it isn't. So we're still sort of a shopping and arts hub for the neighboring towns. Also for our main was the low cost hole and the high cost donut. So if you looked at housing costs for a long time, Maynard was sort of the escape valve for people coming out of the city, but not so much longer. I'm now seeing houses in Maynard going for 800,000, which is a shock, but it just means that this area became a little bit less than that. I do want to mention there are um, nine books spanning 1921, the 50th anniversary, to 2014. Um, and then there's a sesquicentennial book, which was issued in 2021. Now, if, if you remember, for that year, since I was on the committee, I gave a lecture every month on the history of Maynard and had great joy. What I learned at that time is it takes about 40 hours of prep to give a 40-minute lecture. <laughs> Um, if we talk about Founders Day because we're close to it, April 19th, 1871 was the actual legal creation of Maynard. So we, for a while, we're trying to celebrate Founders Day, but that's fallen into, um, uh, I say, disuse. Uh, I'll also note that, if you note very carefully, the clock is showing the time as 2 o'clock. The actual emblem on the town seal is 10 after 12, which is an entirely different story we're not going to talk about today. But you have to realize that that... 2 o'clock is not right, and 10 after 12 is. Some of you do remember when the town had a town siren, and it would be sounded every day at lunch at 10 after 12, and no more. The, uh, the horns are actually inside the fire station, the new fire station is part of the history collection. I miss it. I miss, oh, it's 12.10. <laughs> All right. Let's take a moment now for questions, and then we'll look at these bonus slides. So any questions right now about how Maynard became Maynard? Yeah, I wonder who or what department would be responsible should they decide to update those markers with a more recent date. The select board themselves are supposed to personally go to those markers okay. we know who or, or their designated representative <laughs> to get out there and, and paint a new number and check that they're still there. So, but... It, Many towns have what called boundary walkers who would check, walk the boundaries of town once a year to check that people from other towns were not encroaching. <laughs> so there, there's, there's, there's always important, you know, checking your boundaries, checking your town. Okay, so there's a question, and the answer is the Thank select you. board. Thank you. So someone told me that Maynard became a mill town because um, the topography wasn't suitable for farming, but it sounds like that that's not really the case. It's more about the bend the river. Well, basically it is. Question? The point, and so the question is, why did Maynard become a mill town? And the answer is because of the steepness of the river. Flat rivers tend to have floodplains and tend to be conducive to farming. The Sudbury River, the Concord River have areas that were marshes, that were drained, that were planted. The Native Americans also tended to live there because you wanted year-round water. Um, you wanted to be able to fish year-round. You wanted to be able to get you know, mussels year-round. And Maynard, by the time the river got here, it was a steep area. In fact, all of the Assabet, it starts out flat as it gets larger it's steep so you had a series of mills all the way from like Marlboro all the way down to, to West Concord because of the steepness of the river and the land was considered poor land it wasn't conducive to farming it wasn't really flat enough it sort of you could manage um, maybe sheep and cattle for grazing but again 
that's, that's not an export. That's, that, that's not going to support a population density. So the answer was yes, poor land and the steepness of the river together said, okay, what's it good for? It's good for power. So question. You mentioned the town siren. Was there also a sundown siren? No. No. The question is, was Maynard a sundown town? Are any of you familiar with that term? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sundown towns are better known in the South where often there was a white community and a neighboring black community and people who lived in the black community might work or shop in the white community where the stores were but were supposed to be out of town before sundown. Maynard, as of much of Massachusetts, was predominantly white. And one of the reasons was even though slavery was legal here, it wasn't financially valuable. There were no plantations, there were no crops, there were no cash crops. Slaves were a luxury item that a wealthy person might have one or two to cook the food, chop the wood, take care of the horses. So you had the, the, the upper class would have a few slaves who would also be living in the same house as their owners going to the same church. There was not a large enough black community in any of these areas to say you have to stay in your part of town at night. So even though I've also seen in print some saying Maynard was a sundown town, it, it, by any definition of the term, it was not. So have I answered your question? I think trying, trying to answer clearly. Um, I'm not saying there wasn't prejudice. In the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan was very active in this area, not against African-Americans, blacks, but against Catholics, which were seen as the great immigrant threat to, and you also had the, the you had this waves on and off, so you had the Civil War, the anti-immigrant, the anti-Irish, especially in New York, and again, all through the 20s, you had this anti-Catholic, and that was the conflict that led to people becoming members of the Klan in, in this area, but not anti-black and not a sundown town. Okay, other questions? Sir? Can you mention something about the ammo dump? Yes. I didn't go into this at great length, uh, but if you've read Paul Boothroy, the book he and his sons published recently, in 1942, the U.S. government, basically the U.S. Army, seized 20% of Maynard by eminent domain, forcing people to leave their property in as little as a couple of weeks, able to take only what you know, wasn't nailed down, so it took their, their how they could take their goods, but if they had farm animals, they were selling their farm animals, others perhaps at a loss, they were compensated financially, but they were adrift. They were being kicked out of the property because this acreage in Maynard, Hudson, and Stowe was desired by the Army to make this a munitions storage area. And the reason they wanted it out here is because they wanted it far enough from the coast that if a German battleship showed up on the coast, it would not be able to shell the munitions area. So the munitions were stored here and were brought down to the Boston Navy Yard on an as-needed basis to be loaded onto ships and sent out across the Atlantic. But what we had was you know, 50, 70 bunkers all built, each one sort of uh, separate from the others, heavily fortified, uh, covered with dirt to hold munitions. There was a whole railroad complex in there. If you've ever been into the National Wildlife Refuge, the bunkers are still there. There's trees growing up out of the roof. You can you get a tour and go inside one of them. Um, the Army, in its wisdom, also sprayed arsenic uh, uh, herbicides along the railroad to keep the railroads open. So the air is heavy polluted in many different ways, which is one of the reasons why it was turned over to Wildlife Refuge, because it was too contaminated to become housing. <laughs> so, hence we have the National Wildlife Refuge which was the ammo dump, and long after World War II and the owners were promised they'd get their land back, the Army kept it and used it as a testing area for fire retardant chemicals and fire retardant clothing and, and dropping goods out of parachutes to see if the right type of wrapping would keep the goods from breaking. So it, it stayed as, as part of the Army for a very long time and was used and then shut down, was, became a Superfund cleanup site, and what's left is still contaminated enough that People don't live there, but animals definitely do. Mm -hmm. All right, so that, that sort of answers the question of how we ended up with the ammo dump. 
Um, interestingly, after, during World War II, there was a concern that led Maynard to build a observation tower on the top of Summer Hill, which by the way, was pasture at the time, not woods. And the observation tower was there so people could stay there and watch for enemy airplanes. Now, can any tell, anyone tell me what's wrong with that idea? <laughs> what's wrong with the idea is that Germany had no aircraft carriers. There was never going to be an enemy airplane on the east coast of the United States. There were submarine spotting towers along the coast, but there was no need to look for enemy airplanes. And yet still, Maynard built the tower and uh, had observer, ob observers up there. It was later turned over to, I think, the Boy Scouts. There may be people in this audience or in this town who remember being up in that tower. And then it, I think it burned in the 60s. And it's, it's long. I'm not even sure exactly where, maybe where uh, the water tanks are now. But the point was, yes, during World War II, there was the munitions area. And there was also, incidentally, a uh, observation tower. OK, another question. I must have, yes. Well, I have a brief comment and a question. And the comment is um, another tenant of the mill around the uh, monster.com days was Kurt Schilling's video game company. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> that, yes. That and I don't remember the name. Do you remember? 38 Studios. 38 Studios. His, that's right, his uniform number. And then he was enticed away by Rhode Island because he was given a favorable tax deal and the company had never released a game. And he lost most of his money, as did many others. But Rhode Island's money, too. Um, yes. The, other, yeah. the, the question is uh, the Finnish workers that settled here. Yes. When about was that and what kind of work were they doing in the mills? Were they like the Irish? Or okay, it opens up a good question. Um, the mill operations under the Maynard family and under American Woolen was, of course, adamantly anti-union. And one of the ways they prevented the formation of unions was they kept on bringing in different immigrant groups who spoke different languages and distrusted each other. So the, the Irish were here. Um, the Finns were here. There were Italians. There were Russians. We have a Russian Orthodox Church. At one point, we had five public saunas, saunas here in Maynard and many private saunas because even among the Finns, there were the drinking Finns and there were the non-drinking Finns and there were the communist Finns and there were socialist <laughs> Finns. The point was, with the Russian War of Revolution, circa 1919, the Finns who were basically an era controlled by Russia also had a war of independence against Russia and seceded and separated themselves as a country. At the same time, there was a civil war in Finland between the Finnish communists and the Finnish socialists. The communists lost. So you had all sorts of Finnish emigrants leaving Finland and coming to the United States. And it was sort of that whole area of 1910, 1920, 1925 that led to a town that was the population of the town was, was nearly one-fifth Finnish at one point. Um, they assimilated. Their children learned English instead of Finnish. The church services switched over to English instead of Finnish. The co-op annual meetings turned over to English instead of Finnish. But if you walk through the cemetery, you're going to see a lot of Finnish names. And there are still, of course, many people living here who have a Finnish heritage. And I also managed Polish because at one point we had a Polish Catholic church, which is now an Indian Orthodox church. So you can, by tracking your churches, you see your, 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 your populations and your groups. The, um, Elks Lodge, I, I think, was a, a um, Finnish social organization at one point. So other questions or comments on that? Can you update us in terms of the Native American influence? You talked about how small they were. Yes. But the Nimmo that lived here were not the ones that sold the property. For Concord, yes. Um, so whatever happened then in terms of that population that did live here? And is there any remaining kind of claims of territory? Okay. One of the talks I gave was what it called Before the Colonists Got Here and After. And I had put in my 40 hours, and I had my 40-minute talk set. And then because of a family connection, I was able to send my script and slides to a 
Nipmuc Native American who said, this is not good enough. Yeah. He says, you, you've captured all of the white person's version of the history and not our version. So the point is, the Nipmuc are still here. They are predominantly in the Worcester area and south of Worcester. There is still a continuous area that's, that, is, that is reservation land. The Nipmuc are res recognized as a tribe by the state of Massachusetts, but not by the federal government. Um, as far as I know, there are no active claims to land, but you do hear the horrible stories of how first, after, well, during King Philip's War, 1676, the non-combatant neutral Nipmuc were suspected of cooperating with the Indian uprising and thus were rounded up and plumped off to Deer Island in Boston Harbor, uh, basically the first concentration camp, uh, where many died due to exposure and starvation and disease. Um, afterwards, they were only allowed to return to five communities in Massachusetts, which same became de facto reservations. This might actually fits into your concept of sundown town. The Native Americans were told, you have to live in these five areas, each of which was then, because it was so controlled by the, the, the growing white population, was chopped up, cut off, sold, so that um, the land shrank and shrank. And, and um, many moved much further west and, and assimilated to other Native American tribes um, in New York or stayed and are still here. So I, I've, I've sort of answered the question of, of um, there are people still who are basically, their point is, we're still here, who are Nipmuc and reckon, identify as Nipmuc. Uh, and same for all the other tribes that you see on that, that, that tribal map. Um, what rights do they have in being recognized by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as a tribe? I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, I, 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 it might mean they can, they can get access to some state money, but not federal money that's provided and, and legalities. So it, it's, it's an area I, 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 didn't, I didn't go into, but I did put another 40 hours into my talk. Um, and I felt that I gave them. My, and and uh, the person who said, criticized me said, it's better. <laughs> didn't say it's good, but he said it was better. Okay, question here. The evolution of the drinking water from White's Pond to the pumping station for the Summer Hill to gravity down for the town. Yes. Um, interesting. When Maynard was created, it owned water rights to White's Pond, which is basically in it's, it's, it's Hudson, Sudbury. It, it might be Sudbury, Hudson, but, but the point is, and it had a pipe, had pipes running from White's Pond to Maynard, and it pumped water to a tank on the top of Summer Hill. This was circa 1888 when Maynard started having town water supply. Prior to that, it was wells. Interestingly, and aside, I thought with my house having built 1871, there would have been a, would have been a well on my property. But what I later learned is there were town wells around town. Some people had their own. Otherwise, there were town wells, and you had to go to that well to get your water and bring it back to your house. So even though I'm on Maple Street, the nearest well was on... on Brooks and Concord Street in, in a house over there. And, and anyone from my street would have to go there with a wagon or a sled in winter to get their water or bring it back to their house. Once there was the tank on top of Summer Hill, and you have to a large, a very, very large tank open to the sky, okay, that became the town water supply. And over time, more and more water pipes were added, fire hydrants were added. Um, a second tank was built there. The first tank was capped. The second tank capped. So right now, the town abandoned White's Pond, but it still owns water rights to White's Pond, which is, I think, one of the points you're raising. It, but it would be very expensive to reactivate White's Pond as a water supply because you have no pipe between there and here. Uh, so instead, the town depends on fields of wells around town, dips into the aquifer, pumps up its water, asks everyone to conserve water in the summer, and this town goes, pumps up about 800,000 gallons of water every day. And that seems to be sustainable. However, the town population probably can't grow much more beyond the 11,000 it is, 
because we're limited until we start tapping into Quaban or some other source or back to White, White's Pond, the town has a limited water supply based on its own aquifers in Maynard. Follow-up question. Is the pipeline still going from White's Pond to the pump station, which is down by no, the end of the No, it's long gone. There, there's no, there's no I, I don't think anyone dug it up, but it's not, it's not functional and cannot be revived. Okay. So it, it, it's a theory. We own water rights to White's Pond, but it's not used. And um, it would be, we're talking tens of millions of dollars to, to resurrect that as a water supply. I had heard that Hudson was drilling wells down at an angle to... Uh, uh, that watershed? That, uh, aquifer down there. Oh. So. <sighs> And if you saw the movie, There Will Be Blood, but it talks about an oil well person who says, sell, sell me your oil rights, or if not, I'll angle my pipes under your land. Um, I don't think Maynard is, is legally really trying to fight that, and it may well be true that Hudson's trying to tap into that aquifer that, su that supports White's Pond. Uh, the reason, I don't know if you were around here, in the mid-60s, there were some very severe droughts, multiple year droughts, and Mark Maynard's White Pond was drying up and Maynard was really close to losing its water supply, which is why at that point it started adding wells and switching over to wells, and then finally 100% wells. But I think it was as late as the 60s, Maynard was still using White's Pond, uh, but no more. Okay, another question. If not, I've got a couple of bonus slides we'll bang through, and then you can um, depart, hopefully more informed. Uh, look at the mugs and books. This is an actual piece of carpet um, that was made and is in the collection of the Maynard Historical Society. It seems they were really quite skilled in, in the weaving they were doing. This is Harriman's Laundry. Um, Harriman's, it's a bit faint to read, the signs that Harriman's New Method Laundry, this was on Harriman's, near where Bud's Variety Store is right now on Main Street, second largest business in Maynard, um, picked up dirty laundry, cleaned it, returned it, had horse-drawn wagons taking laundry to town surrounding. They were serving West, West Acton and, and West Concord and, and uh, parts of Stowe. And um, the new method is dry cleaning. This was the beginning of the dry cleaning operation. So there it is, Harriman's new method. And the Harriman brothers were really quite wealthy because of this and were some of the very first car owners in Maynard, circa 1905, 6, 7. The first car owners in town were buying... Stanley steamers, steam-powered cars, and then they're also buying gas-powered cars and having races up and down Main Street. So you can imagine what it's like when you've got 250 horses in town and a couple of idiots driving around at, at <laughs> 20 miles an hour in their cars on, on, on Main Street. But there it was, Harriman. There was a steam launch that would take people from Maynard up the Aspect River to Lake Boone which was a summer community and summer cottages. And it ran back and forth. I think for a dime, you could ride the steam launch. From, from, and there was a trolley system. So the trolley system ran from 1900 to 1920. And that was where the trolley station was. And the trolley served east all the way to Concord, west to Hudson Circle, and a branch that went up to Acton. So for again, for a nickel, you could ride from those towns into Maynard. And then you could also take the, uh, the steam launch up to your summer cottage on, on Lake Boone. This is Main Street looking east. You've still got what was the Masons building at the time. Uh, you notice a wicker structure at the right. That was a bandstand um, for the Maynard Town Band. And it actually had electric lights. And there were concerts there, um, I think, uh, Wednesday and, and, and Saturday nights. People come bring their chairs or sit right there on Main Street because there weren't that many cars and, and listen to bands. It, um, so that's what Main Street looked like at the time. And you notice the trolley running down the center of it, and the street's unpaved, basically dirt. What year would that have been? Well, um, if it's the trolley, it's somewhere between 900 and 1920. I can't even put an exact year on it, uh, but, but that's um, probably around 1910. Let, let, let's sort of say somewhere in the middle. Uh, the bandstand was, uh, only lasted until 1916. What happened was there was more than one band in town. They were fighting over who got to use the bandstand. <laughs> and, and rather than working out a sharing, the people who actually owned it, even though it was on town land, owned it, 
um, loaded onto a wagon and hauled it away, and it never came back. So, uh, there, but there's, there's. Okay, so here, this is on a hill that's in the forest reserve. You're looking towards what is now um, the Indian Orthodox Church. This would have been uh, the docks for the trolley, not for the for the for the steamship. Uh, what you see on the right, with the writing on it, was the ice house, the bent ice house, because they would cut ice um, on the Assabet and then load it onto the railroad and haul it away. There was also, for a while, an ice house on the mill pond itself. Uh, the chimney was there because that was the power station for the trolley. Uh, again, Main Street, this is the parade on to celebrate Maynard's, um, I think, 50th anniversary. Uh, the bridge you see down in front was was an iron bridge that was replaced in 1922 by the current bridge, which if you haven't kept up with the news, is about to be replaced. So the Main Street Bridge is next due for replacements, having done the Florida Street Bridge. You notice at that point there were still um, telephone pole towers for power. The mill owned houses, especially in President's Village, and during the Depression of uh, circa 1932-33, sold the houses to people. So this, this was basically an announcement of the auction of the houses um, that were in the President's Village area. An aerial view, is, so you see the large buildings, the pond partially frozen over, no parking lots. All right, how many of you have been on the Assabet Rail Trail and walked across the Assabet River? At the t originally, there was this trestle bridge quite elevated above the land because as you came south, you stayed on this, this high bridge because the ground dipped down to the river and then came up again, and, the, and then it rejoined it, and it was actually a bridge over Florida Street, and then as the land came up to Railroad Street, it came level again. So the, the original bridge was this trestle, and below it, there was this small bridge which is basically used to move coal from the coal station to the coal selling places. So you had these, these two bridges. This would have been 1971 for Maynard's centennial celebration, which included an inner tube race down the Assabet River. <laughs> and people are lined up. And people, some of the older people down do remember crossing this bridge on foot as children because it was just one way to get across town. So you're walking on this bridge with no railing, carefully stepping on the ties as you're walking across, um, which you never told your parents what you were doing. But there was that bridge, there was this bridge, and there was the Assabet, and now currently there is the, the bridge for the rail trail. And here it is. This is the current bridge being assembled and then lifted in by crane and put into that spot. And that's it. Thank you so much for sharing this afternoon with me. And I'd say right now, we're good to go. But if you have any questions to ask, I'm here or I'll be signing books over there. <laughs>